Well, another year goes by, another top 5 is required by the almighty gods of standardized entertainment. Is it me or are these top 5s coming further and further from each other with each passing year? Maybe my employer should stop feeding me this much anime all the bloody time. That would be nice. Would also be nice, view-wise, to at least once do this on actual Christian year's end instead of whatever I so happen to finish the previous season. New Year's Eve is a great time for these top 5s, but I don't mind. One can always dedicate this video to some celebration. So, happy Falklands Liberation Day, everyone! I'm sure Argentinians are overjoyed by that event and aren't bitter in the slightest. As always, I have to remind you that only animes I've rambled about count for this video. That's my insurance policy against people asking why isn't Nekopara on this list. So, without further delays... <sighs> I am a sucker for jazz music and dark stories, so it's of no surprise that I liked Bem enough to grant it a fifth place. Not sure if that's a good thing though, but it is what it is. Eh. People commonly think that the first place is the hardest to decide, but in actuality it's always the last place that is the hardest, especially when you try to decide which of the stuff you watched you don't care about the least. I guess Kimarikosa gets this place solely because I at least remember the opening and the looks of the heroes, which is already saying something. <sighs> As we all know, the smelliest shit is commonly recently made, and this is true for Infinite Dendrogram, a lazy VR MMO anime with a main character about as sympathetic or struggling as an average white Canadian university student and about as interesting as asking that student about his sex life. Ah! Gotta admit, this one is mostly made here due to its world building than actual quality. The show raises some interesting questions I think I never seen explored in anything like this before, and for that reason alone it's worthy of a fourth spot, even if I'm essentially giving it because I'll cannibalize it for parts later. Eh? <sighs> Comedies are probably the easiest things for me to put on a list such as this, for most comedies Japanese produce either make me want to puke or bore me to tears. Bofuri is more of an example of the latter. Perfectly functional, but boring to watch. At least the memes are fun. <sighs> It was a very tough choice, you know, between this and Astra Lost in Space, but after weighting my options carefully, I've come to the conclusion that Ari Furetta from Anime Lover to Lester the Child Molester is more worthy of the fourth place than Astra. When I remember Astra, I mostly remember that I had fun laughing at the plot. All I remember about Ari Furetta is that the comedy of the show made me want to vomit. Ah! This one was actually a bit hard to decide, as both Somali and If It's For My Daughter are basically the same anime if boiled down to basics, so I have decided to give this one to both. I like them enough to recommend, and the characters are fun. Eh. And now we're coming to titles I barely remember watching. Nothing fancy really, I just barely remember watching Yonk Nobunaga, other than that all men there looked like they're one scene away from fucking each other. Eh. Oh, Inspector, how do I describe you and be funny at the same time? You're like a vampire, only if vampires charm people before sucking their blood, you bore people to death with pretentiousness before confusing the fuck out of them. Ah! I was hesitant to reward Demon Slayer just for being a good shonen anime, but then I looked at other contenders for that title and there's nothing that is just like Demon Slayer on the market. A decent traditional shonen anime that has all the ingredients to be good. Gore, epic powers, and villains that aren't made out of Vegemite. Eh? There is a certain process on how I choose the blandest animes, but the biggest and the most important criteria is whether or not I remember I've watched them in the first place. Wise Man's Grandchild came dangerously close to the first place, but then I remembered that it had a magical system that would be interesting to explore in a better anime or a game. <sighs> There is no fate worse for a story than being terribly adapted, because most people will watch or remember the movie more than the thing it was adapted from, and for this reason I give the honored silver prize of being the worst anime of the year to to the abandoned sacred beasts. Not only your plot was boring and predictable dog shit, you also managed to turn the main heroine from a competent heroine she is in the manga to a retarded plot device in the anime. Congratulations! I hope you fall and break your kneecaps. I could have used a more flowery language, but I don't want to put in more effort than the studio that made this tripe. Ah! Dororo is great, and a great example of how to adapt old and venerable animes for a newer, less patient generation. It has memorable songs, pleasant graphics, decent action, and characters you can give a shit about. What more do you want? Eh? And speaking of things I don't even remember watching, if I wasn't rechecking every ramble I've done so far, I wouldn't even remember I watched Domestic Girlfriend. I've rewatched that ramble about 15 minutes ago and I already forgotten what it's about. That, my dear listeners, is the sign of a true blue-blooded mediocre anime. <sighs> 
I think this one was a bit predictable. When people think of the shittiest anime, they usually imagine something that is either boring to watch or horribly executed. And nothing screams that more to me than virtual sun looking, an assault to most of my senses except for smell with a ridiculous plot, retarded storylines and characters that are about as sympathetic or engaging as watching a stroop tease performed by a dead beluga whale. Another example of why YouTubers should not be allowed anywhere close to movie making equipment is if other examples weren't convincing enough. So as most people who watch Watch me know, there is a lot of visual novels in Japan that get their own adaptations or spin-offs as they're basically manga for people who can only read from monitors, but I doubt a lot of you can call a lot of them brands or a franchise, and if you can, not a lot of them have international fame. Stuff like Toho and Fate are probably the most obvious examples of it. It's a thing that requires and doesn't require an explanation, as anyone who had at least a small interest in anime have at least seen one fan art based on them, and they have the biggest problems all brands and franchises have, and that eventually they become self-sustainable and inevitably dense to any newcomer. Case in point, Fate Collide Liner Prisma Ilia, one of the two Fate spin-offs I know and care about. Unlike the original that depicts a war over some form of MacGuffin, this one depicts one of the characters, Ilia, becoming a magical girl and collecting MacGuffins. God 2013 was a much simpler time. But yes, of the plot is basic magical girl stuff you've probably seen at least once. There's a girl, there's a magic vibrator to combine and go fight evil in whatever myriad of forms it may manifest. The only big difference from any other show about magical girls that isn't a deconstruction or pretentious is that this one has characters that people who like Fate might recognize! And good for them, I say, but to people whose only previous interaction with Fate was at best porn-related, there is not really much to it. In fact, there really is nothing to it. The plot, the graphics, and even the music are all stock. It has zero creativity or wit put into it. All jokes and gags are repeated at least once over the course of the series. The enemies they fight are all spirits from Fate Universe, so there's not even even originality in that, and the 10 episode format makes some scenes feel rushed. The best comparison would be the Big Order OVA, that is basically a retelling of the first 2-3 episodes of the series with some new scenes, only in case of Ilya that retelling was stretched out into 10 episodes. The same with Nekopara, really. I've tried watching this show, got into episode 5 and then understood that this show isn't for me. It was clearly created for fans, and while I have nothing against it, it does mean that it automatically excludes those who aren't fans, as those who only have a casual knowledge of the series will feel a bit alienated by the stuff they only have a vague understanding of, and those who aren't fans will simply be bored. So in conclusion, Fate Katana Sushi Harakiri Stepan is a very specific thing for the initiated that requires you liking Fate Universe to really appreciate it, but others will feel disassociated because the show is barely expatiated. The anime industry equivalent of shrugging your shoulders while doing confused noises. I guess it has lesbians, which is good for representation and someone's genitals, but that means jack shit in today's industry. Lesbians are the vanilla flavor of queer relationships. It's the thing everyone does when they desperately want to portray gay people in their work, but don't want religious or conservative fundamentalists to kidnap their families. Robot Carnival is an anthology featuring works of several animators of the 80s, all tied to theme of robots. Other than that, it's a bunch of unrelated shorts that feature a robot in one way or another. This anime is more of an example of how different was the anime industry in the 80s than anything good. Tough luck making something like this in this day and age, but other than that, it's frankly a bit boring. Oh, the animation is great, if typical 80s anime, the music is a bit stock but they don't tend to repeat the same track, which is good. The plots of every short are so straightforward, there's really not much you can say about them. I guess the most generous way for me to describe them would be comparing them to a music video. Making those is an art form within itself, and a lot of them are great, but you don't really watch them just for the animation alone now, do you? The same here. If you really want to watch this, I suggest to not waste your time on the entire film, find those shorts that may interest you and watch them. It's rather boring otherwise. Well, I knew it was going to happen someday, chaos theory and all that. Someday, someone will order an anime that I've watched before and fucking despise. I usually try my hardest to postpone the inevitable because I know that this isn't just going to suck dick. <laughs> oh no, it's going to gobble schlongs of enlightened rhinos and I don't get nearly enough money out of this to justify torturing myself. But, well, this rhino isn't going to suck itself. Might as well get this over with. Terror in Tokyo. Listen, I know a shop that makes custom flashlights. Maybe we can... All right, all right, sheesh. Terror in Tokyo is an original 11-episode anime created in 2014 by Mappa and Shinichiro Watanabe of the Cowboy Bebop and Space Dandy fame. It tells us a story about two boys that decided to blow up Japan for undisclosed reasons, a typical gruff detective who doesn't play by the rules that has to untangle a net of conspiracy, and a girl whose main contribution to the story is that she is very sad. You know, the saddest part about all of this is that the anime is actually a lot better than I remember it to be. The graphics are nice, each character is visually distinct, each animation is played when needed, 
repeated and there were only four major repeated frames I've spotted. The music is not only very nice, but was also composed by a lot of overseas authors, including some Icelandic ones, and each important track plays only once where it is needed the most. The bot itself is fairly typical for this sort of serious anime with political undertones, but it does its job. Most characters, even if generic, are at the very least interesting to watch, while those who do not irritate me to the point where to this day I hate everything about the show. Well, I say those, the perpetrator for my butthurt is but one character and it is Lisa Mishima. My biggest problem with her is that she's practically pointless in this story, yes, even in the end, doesn't matter how hard you try preaching those pretentious morals about hope. Spoilers up ahead, so, you know, go dump your head under water for about 2-3 minutes and inhale a lot of laughing gas. This is 9, 12, and to some extent 5. They are autistic orphans who were chosen by the jingoistic politicians to be turned into superhumans, but they've escaped from the program in one way or another and now have a limited lifespan. The whole point of the story from 9's and 12's perspective is that by conducting acts of terrorism they wanted to show Japan, possibly even the whole world, that performing illegal human experiments is not a very kind thing to do. And you know what's the story of Lisa? She is bullied at school, has an overbearing mother and is very sad. None of these problems are actually solved in the story, by the way. None of her contributions couldn't be done by either hired goons or one of the boys. And practically the only reason why she is there is because we needed a person who's just as clueless as the audience and said women tend to be the easiest to empathize. And as I've said, in the end of the story nothing has changed. A year passed by, her mother is still alive, her bullies are probably as well. What changed? She's gotten happier. Or did we really need her solely for the last scene? Anyway, before I go on a tangent, the show is not bad. Basically a thriller mixed with melodrama. If you like that sort of thing, then you'll most likely like this anime. If you like political drama, then it's also not the worst anime to watch as it is pretty thematic even to this day. Lisa is inconsequential enough to the story that she's either easy to miss entirely and only remember the good parts or will irritate you every time she's on the screen. Kinda like most presidents, if you think about it. Praise the COVID for this season! Look Looks like a pretty nice one. There's not a lot of big animes for me to watch, but it also means that I have time to watch some old ones, watch some new ones, and uh, now if only this damn summer ended faster. It's hard to work as it is in regular days of the week when it's plus 40 Celsius or 104 Fahrenheit and it seems everyone around you is one bad day away from either offing themselves or somebody, well, let's just say it's not helping matters. My next life as a villainess, all routes lead to doom. <laughs> Roots. It's a 12 episode romantic isekai cockblock harem anime created by Studio Silverlink about a spoiled brat who got hit in the head so hard she remembered her previous life as well as who she is and what is going to happen to her because she is in a world of a game she liked to play a lot. Because frankly nothing good is going to happen to her, she decided to do everything in her power to avoid her doom and by that I mean she unknowingly makes everyone fall in love with her, including the main heroine of the game, but she is none the wiser because she is very very dense. Going to be honest here, I never thought I would like this show as much as I did. Not only the name is long and obnoxious, but it's also a Nisekai and it looked kinda lazy at first glance, but I was pleasantly surprised. The characters, especially the main one, are the strongest element of the show, or to be more precise, it's pretty much the only reason why you would ever watch this anime in the first place, harem genre and all that. The interaction between them is cleverly and consistently written, every character is both memorable and pleasant, it doesn't go overboard with screaming, though I'm more than certain it's due to voice actors' job than the dialogue. I guess my biggest complaint would be that once or twice the show feels like it takes its audience for complete and utter brain deads, but it's not something you wouldn't see in other anime, and I get the feeling that this is a side effect of them adapting the plot of a light novel. The graphics are not bad, but not so good either, which is a good thing. Thing, mind you. It serves its job and is pleasant to look at, especially the freeze frames that were done in a slightly different style the first couple of episodes. The music isn't that memorable, but since I can't say anything bad about it, it did its job. I guess the biggest reason why people would want to avoid this show is that it is nothing special in the grand scheme of things. It's basically a less ridiculous and less action-packed Konosuba, which is something I personally wanted, but I can't see people getting bored by the anime as it literally lives or dies on your tolerance to both the main heroine and the shenanigans of others. And yes, the world around them is frankly generic and a bit boring. The existence of magic is a plot device at best and a clumsily made one at worst. The ending feels a bit rushed, but I have a strong suspicion that this was a deliberate choice. Practically speaking, the only unique thing about this show, if we're being very boring and pedantic, is that this is one of the rare examples of a bisexual harem anime. A well-made one, sure, but just like a rare steak, tastiness and food poisoning is but a matter of perspective. You know, one thing the anime industry is better than the rest is that there's almost no large gaps between releases, especially when you do a weekly show like I do. By the time you'll be finished with one season, the next one either finished itself or might as well be finished, so there's never any shortage of content, at 
like, let's say, cartoon or video games industry, it does wear you down on occasion, but, well, that's what interseasonals are for. A way for me to relax and talk about something else. Arte is a 12-episode historical job anime created by Studio 7 Arcs that tells us a story about Arte, a lower noble girl who wants to become an artist in 16th century Florence, and that's... Pretty much it, really. We follow her on her way to become a master artisan, even though it is a predominantly man's job and everyone tells her to go back to kitchen, while she meets various people who either like her or tell her that she's a woman at her places in the kitchen or be a dick warmer to some rich noble. The word feminist anime was often used when my employers talked or described this show, and though I can most certainly see why, don't let it fool or scare you away, because this is, quite frankly, fairly typical for this sort of genre, not to mention that fish out of water cliche is fairly common in anime in general. The most basic way for me to describe the story of Arte would be me saying slice of life and profession anime. It is a show about a girl who just does her daily job while a lot of words is told about why things are the way they are. Arte is a character is basically a girl that likes or wants to do boy stuff, her art tutor is a cold gruff old man, there's a bratty girl, blah blah blah, kinda like with the previous anime, your enjoyment of it will depend on your enjoyment of the character interactions as a whole. Well, and maybe if you like Italian culture, anachronisms and Japanese elements notwithstanding. I'm not going to say it's it's a bad anime, quite the opposite, really. Arte is a character is pretty pleasant and fun to watch, she's hardworking, not really obnoxious, and is really passionate about what she does. The supporting cast is fun in its own right, and most importantly, shippable with Arte, which means that the usual brood of fans will have something to talk about. The music is smooth and helps lulling you into watching. The graphics are... well... Uh, they are nicer in action, but on screenshots you can see the cut corners and overall cheapness of the production. The historical setting is fairly well made, at least as good as it can get without going into details. So to summarize, Arte is not unpleasant to watch, it is a well-crafted, light-hearted story about a girl who follows her dreams and lives a happy life as a result. Kinda like Hakume and Mikochi, and just like Hakume and Mikochi, it will be quickly forgotten compared to the heavy hitters of the season, leaving it to be that nice little anime people occasionally remember but never quite wanting to rewatch without a reason. Still, if you want to watch something wholesome and optimistic, then this anime is made for you. If you don't, well, then think about it in this way. It is a show where men have a set of hard standards to adhere to, women who wish to work in their environment have to do more work just for their co-workers to not scoff at them, both are ultimately objectified as their labor is the only thing that matters, while the union dedicated to protect workers' rights not only allows but enforces this. There is probably some sort of commentary in that whole sentence, but it's merely an anime, so why should you care? I swore that I wouldn't say anything bad about my fellow colleagues, he who is sinless and all that, but there is a lot of things I am miffed about in the anime sphere, and the notion of reviewing a single episode of the show has to be in one of my top 10 things I simply can't stand. My first experience of the topic of this ramble was from a website, Anime Feminist, and its review of the first episode of the show. First out of 24, mind you. It is unprofessional at best, batting at worst, but perhaps the biggest reason why I want this practice to die is that it is simply disrespectful to the anime in question. All of those juicy feminist themes, postmodern interpretations of gender-specific stereotypes, and all the other hoogly-boogly, you're not going to discern all of those from just one episode, it's like judging the book's story by just looking at a preview. And it's especially so with this anime, because of its plot, though, as per usual, the descriptions of the show weren't any better. Tell me, which sounds more interesting? Alcia is a world governed by count, numbers and great on a person's body representing any numbers related to their life. These counts determine a person's social status and power in Alsia. If a count reaches zero, the person is sent to the abyss, a place rumored to be worse than death. Or, a bunch of rebels fight against oppressive government in a world that strongly resembles that Orwell's book everyone loves. Anyway, Plunderer is a 24-episode action anime developed by the new studio Geek Toys. It tells us a story of Lichte Bach and his assortment of friends, frenemies and love interests fighting against the world as they know it, where you have to swear on doing something all the time or else tentacle hands from outer space will drag you into their rape dungeon. Well, at least that is the story they originally present, until, well, for the sake of avoiding spoilers, let's just say, suddenly demons. See, the problem why just reviewing one episode of the anime doesn't really do any sort of justice to the narrative is because the entirety of Plunderer Plunderer's story basically depends on viewers not knowing about the big twist in the middle of it. Another problem, but with such an approach to storytelling, is that you have to make parts before the twist at least somewhat interesting, and that is where the anime falls apart quicker than a car made in a post-Soviet country. So here's how it's structured, okay? About eight first episodes are dedicated to establishing the main characters of the story. Licht, the blue-haired girl that likes him, the police force that acts as his frenemies, the weird 
Deus Ex Machina, you know, the drill. In fact, as you've probably seen, it's not a very new story for the Japanese. Then three episodes are dedicated to a twist, seven episodes to establishing the backstory for Licht, and the rest of the episodes are fucking bullshit. It is a fairly generic narrative structure, all things considered, and admittedly the twist they provide is unexpected given the premise of other episodes. Unfortunately, for a twist to work it has to be either foreshadowed, even if slightly, or the events before the twist have to, if not make sense, then at least be interesting to watch. And they are not, by any stretch of the imagination. What this plot considers to be a main episode would be deemed a filler episode in any other show, as they are nothing more than the main protagonist, just bumbling around in various towns dawdling. You can probably argue that it establishes the character of the people you're supposed to care about, but their characters are so stereotypical that you don't need eight episodes straight to explain them, and even then such stereotypes work best when we can actually control the characters in question. And then after the twist we get to see the sad story of our main hero, who is, as per usual with these narratives, has a very tragic backstory filled with twists and turns and 300 year old dragon lollies and all the other stuff Japanese narratives like these tend to use. So not only your story is very banal, plunderer, you're also turning the protagonist into a Gary Stew. The graphics are fine. They are clearly done by a studio that has to prove themselves before getting anything big and bombastic. The music is a typical orchestral ordeal. It is thematic and doesn't ruin the flow of the show, but neither does it have something memorable outside of that one song that always plays whenever it's time to remember something sad and tragic. It's honestly hard to conclude something about this anime, mostly because the anime itself left on a cliffhanger the size of an entire Iberian Peninsula. I guess before advising you to watch or discard the anime, answer yourself this question. Is a decent plot twist worth 8 episodes of mindless filler? If yes, then I would say the anime is mediocre, but watchable, and besides, all things considered, the plot premise isn't bad, it's the execution of it I have problems with. The biggest problem with Licht as a main character, or any other protagonist similar to him for that matter, is that we have to like not only his background, but also his character. Strip away all the sad stuff, and Licht won't become a likable protagonist, he will be a weird pervert that likes to look at panties, but is too scared to actually do anything further than that. If not, however, don't bother. There are many other, much better ways to kill your time other than watching this, especially if you want a story with a plot twist. I would advise you some, but almost all of them involve a black rat in a gimp suit. The fact that isekai genre is still popular four or so years after its explosion is like the existence of Papua New Guinea or the inexplicable desire to break rules during a life-threatening event. It's just something about both humanity and the current world we live in that I find utterly incomprehensible, especially now where every isekai genre is either comedic or is basically just a fantasy story with some random Japanese body snatcher riding along because the gods were especially bored that day. The main difference of the eighth son, are you kidding me, a 12 episode isekai anime developed by Synergy SP and people who make Doraemon is that it tries to be both and fails miserably at it. So in this anime we follow the story of some Japanese asshole who gets home from his job and gets transported into... Uh, oh. Fuck me. Wendelin von Benno Baumeister, a five-year-old eighth son of a poor land-owning knight in some bumfuck nowhere that is, in actuality, a mage, which in this world basically means that you won all the lottery tickets, took a position of a CEO in an important company, and at least six conventionally attractive women are lining up to receive a portion of your master's sperm. How does him being a Japanese salaryman plays into this, you may ask? Hell if I know, ladies and gentlemen, because it is established that magic is given to people at random, so either the story could just as well function without the isekai element or the only reason we need the main hero to be spiritually Japanese is so that he could spouse how awesome and cool Japanese food is. I'll leave the choice to the viewer. What else is there I hate about it? Oh, that's right, the artificial difficulty of protagonist's starting position. It is a new pet peeve of mine in this Japanese isekai business that the hero starts as something very weak and insignificant and then in a span of a couple of episodes just becomes basically God. At first it did the job just fine, but now it's starting to get tedious, especially in this anime where they aren't even going to pretend that Dwell's upbringing is in any way, shape or form complicates his life. He might as well just be born as a dog and it would change fuck all. He would get his magical powers from a magical magic user and then kill a bone dragon and BAM! But perhaps the biggest thing I hate about this show is how it managed to fuck up even the power fantasy aspect of Isekai. For it to be a power fantasy, the hero is supposed to consciously exercise his power to achieve his own goals, or at the very least remove obstacles. Here, he does neither. Everyone constantly uses him, everything he obtains is a part of some scheme he either doesn't know or barely acknowledges, making it look as if the protagonist has no agency whatsoever outside of the last two episodes, and incidentally, there was a scene in the show where Ventolin summoned panties for a comedic effect, and his Supporting women were all typical Japanese women about it. You are engaged with him, and you two literally sold your vaginas and reproductive rights to him. You don't get to 
play all coy after that. And you may think that I'm being too harsh on the anime, but you see, if this was just another one of those comedic isekais, I would've been more lenient on it, but it isn't. Well, or at least it tries its hardest not to be. Unfortunately, I can't really classify it as a serious anime either, because for it to be serious, the plot doesn't have to look like a bunch of bullet points. The graphics are average, the animation is cheap, the music is probably the only part of the anime I have no problems with, if only because there's not a lot of it, and the opening has the most 90s sounding song I've heard in a long while. Also highly inappropriate tone-wise, but that's nothing to be worried about too much. Maybe the author wanted to create a more realistic take on how a salaryman would actually behave in such a situation, but in the end, Eighth Son of the Eighth Son is a boring, confusing mess with a protagonist who has the charisma of a floor mat, the crew that's both ruthless and exploitative, a setting that is banal, and most importantly, a story that can't decide on what the fuck it wants to be. Outside of a pretty cool opening, it is pretty much a waste of time watching it, and the only thing I regret is that I'll have to actually waste some brain space to remember this anime for the inevitable top 5. My relationship with Trigger as a studio could probably safely be compared to a relationship with a previous lover. All possible love and respect for each other is gone, sure, but now it's all water under the bridge, and we just passive-aggressively growl whenever we hear each other's names. I mean, all things considered, this is the best possible way to go. It's better to send to each other lawyers than shotgun pellets, after all. So brand new Animal, or BNA for short, is an original 12-episode urban fantasy anime created by Studio Trigger as a Netflix exclusive, which after the last news about Netflix sounds especially ironic. It tells us a story of a world where animal people live and a young girl named Kagemori Michiru suddenly has a life-threatening problem on her hands. She's a human, but suddenly she's a tanuki beastman. And in this world, people don't like no beastmen if you get my drift. So she travels to Animacity, a Japanese Bantu stun for beastmen, and gets involved into conspiracies that would not only endanger her, but the fate of every beastman in the world, and so on and so forth. The beastmen in BNA suffer from the same thing Ruby Faunuses suffer, and that it's hard to believe that they're being oppressed by humanity, at least not in any meaningful way. Sure, they have shown that the hatred is so huge people are organizing death squads to hunt them, but if anything, now they at least have their own city, which is better than it was before, especially when they're daring to use real-life events, and... <laughs> Oh, <laughs> trigger. You can play this game. My employers compared the show to Kiznaiver, that being the last trigger anime I've hated so much, but if anything, BNA reminds me of Flip Flappers more. It has the same narrative pacing, where the characters introduced and forgotten within one episode, a conflict between a stoic character and an IEU character, a colorful culmination that is supposed to be looking cool but is insulting the second you actually stop and think about it. It does have some kill la kill elements as well, though, like the bitchy sports club and slum dweller comedy relief characters whose sole purpose in the story as well as the main joke is that they're poor and greedy because they're poor. I suppose the main protagonist also has more in common with Ryuko than Kokona because her beastman powers could be summarized as whatever the plot wants it to be. And that reminds me, the ending, uh... You know, I don't think a dry explanation can explain the exact levels of disdain I have for the show's ending, so instead of trying to be comedic about it, allow me to take a note from the show's direct appeal to real-life events. <clears throat> So imagine, if you will, that there is an undisclosed oppressed group in the world that, as a compensation for the atrocities committed against them, had gotten their own state. The state is supported by the world financially, but in its policies and politics it is pretty much independent and exclusionary. There are many people in the world who, to this day, don't like this group of people, and them getting their own state only pisses them off more. This results in these groups of people militarizing and committing terror acts against them. And those people who are actually supportive of them, in actuality, know little to nothing about beastmen or their needs and seemingly support them only because it's cool and trendy. But you see, all of that I've mentioned is actually bullshit. All of that isn't important in the grand scheme of things because it appears that one of the main sponsors of the state secretly wants to remove everything that makes this oppressed group special, turning them into your bog standard civilized humans. To do so, he manipulates this group using their own religious beliefs and even creates a special sort of vaccine that would turn the target's genes into a genes of a standard human. In fact, he even creates an army of bots designed specifically to enact this sort of task. And do you know why? Because you see all of that group that's oppressed? They're mudbloods. Hybrids. Impure. And only this guy, this apex element of their species, has the correct genes and power to rule over both regular humans and these insignificant subhumans that will be turned into humans anyway to show them their place. One can even say that he considered himself to be genetically superior to other races. What nice information to dump on the viewer in the last fucking episode of the show and then be kinda defeated but not really. The only way this could be handled even more cow-handedly is if this all was written as an addendum to the inevitable manga. The graphics as well as the sound remind me of both earlier trigger works as well as earlier 80s 
these 90s animes these people are clearly inspired by, which means that, well, it does its job. People who still like trigger anime would probably be happy. I personally think that the fight scenes were muddy and the animation overall is not very good. And that's pretty much it, really. This anime is a great example of what would happen if earlier anime trends would survive to this very day. But other than that, I'm not very happy I've watched this. In fact, I'm so spent on this anime, I don't even have any desire to conclude it. So instead, well, I'ma talk about another anime I watch. Making this video the first scene on the Tatabma of this season. <laughs> Yay! It is often said that the Japanese make some weird shit, but for the most part, we only hear about their weird hand eye industry, ignoring that the West has about a equally freaky sex industry with more suffering, no less, or equally weird sports shows where disciplines range from falling balls straight into rocks to synchronous panty sniffing, and maybe I'm just kinda gotten used to this all, or maybe I'm just a dirty cultural relativist, but such things stopped weirding or even surprising me a long time ago. This makes me a bad person to watch shows like Olympia Kiklos, because weirdness of its visuals is pretty much the only redeeming part of it all, and it gets boring pretty fast. It's kinda like SCP or Slenderman or that backdoor creepypasta in a way, it's entertaining at first, but once you understand how it functions, the novelty is gone and you'll see it for the unoriginal Snorfe that it is. The basic point of Olympia Kiklos is to be an ad for 2020 Olympic Games. We follow a claymation Greek living his ancient Greek life and he occasionally gets teleported into drawn Tokyo, Japan where he gets new ideas for whatever thing is troubling him that particular day and that's pretty much it, really. Comedy happens, modern Japan is best and if this was a Hollywood movie made somewhere in the late 30s it would be about a Chinese guy seeing New York for the first time and the silly gook would be the butt of the joke. I wouldn't say it's necessarily a bad anime to watch, especially as this one is one of the seemingly few animes that you could watch right now on YouTube, and admittedly the comedy is typical for a short format comedy show, which means I'll at best hate it, at worst shrug at its predictability. You decide which one I'm leaning towards here. Good morning, fellow Zoomers! It's time to talk about the funny memes while watching a spectrogram of the twerkadoo in the free internets like a bunch of fucking bankers. It is a special rebellious edition of Sino de Totabmo where I ramble about two animes I've watched whose main themes were that of rebellion against the man or woman, we don't discriminate here, and the oppression of the mundane. Or at least that's what I've gotten out of it and you have about 5-6 minutes to waste, so let's begin. We start with Listeners, an original 12 episode anime created by Studio Mappa and a lot of names, one of which wrote Cowboy Bebop. It tells us a story of Wreck Echo, a simple boy living in a junkyard and collecting scrap until suddenly he finds what I assume every straight male zoomer wants to find one day, a living, breathing, naked girl amidst a bunch of scrap. So like any gentleman, he takes her to his house where she wakes up with no memories and proceeds to beat that shit out of him and then he names her. Well, at the very least she has to be thankful her activation button isn't in her vagina. So after naming her Mew, she and he embark on a mecca into the wilderness to witness wonders of a world themed around music and music-related gimmicks. What is it in mecha genre that forces people to write such pretentious scripts? Even Jellion, Gurren Lagan, Darling, every single mecha anime I've watched on this show or bothered to remember has some weird political or philosophical tone to them that in a show about giant robots punching people looks at best a bit weird. And now fucking listeners where a free-spirited boy and a girl wander the world devoid of love and filled with anger and angst and the meaning of love and I can fucking feel my dick just retracting into my body like I'm a fucking Dog. But you know why I deem this to be pretentious garbage and something like Gurren Lagan not? Because as rushed as the anti-spiral campaign was, I at the very least can see the stakes and I care about the characters. Here there's barely any screen time to remember even the motivations of our main characters, let alone villains. In episode 11 there was this gnome princess who went to a gay guy and emotionally told him that she wants to fight for the sake of her friend and I was just sitting there thinking, you've known these people for about one episode, half of which you tried to kill them. Go fuck yourself, anime. I have no idea who these earless are. What the fuck do they want? Why are they attacking people? Why have they killed everyone in the nation they lived peacefully with humans? Neither have I any idea about the motivation of this piece of shit they've pursued the entirety of the anime and the fact that his backstory was changing every episode wasn't helping matters. But the biggest insult to me was the moral of the story. You know, we might look different, but we have to live in peace. A message the show contradicts when every tall boy suddenly turns into slightly weird looking humans. Yes, anime. We will understand creatures from other dimensions better when they look like humans and not like shoggoths. Truly an inspiring message for everyone in the world. And speaking of shoggoths, Wave Listen To Me is a 12 episode slice of life comedy anime directed by Sunrise about Minare Koda, a woman with anger management issues, drinking issues, irresponsibility issues and issues of not knowing when to shut her fucking gob, living her average life of a restaurant worker until suddenly she gets a side gig kinda as an amateur radio talk show host. 
The show is emotionally draining. You know how there's often a character in a shonen anime whose sole contribution to the plot is to be comedy relief and part of that is that he can't shut the fuck up? Well, imagine that this character would have gotten an entire show for him, surrounded by slightly less irritating characters that also like to monologue. And when these characters get together, the result is usually a fast-paced mess that is hard to follow when you understand Japanese, hard to follow when you read subtitles, and I shudder to think on how difficult it must be to actually voice this. On a purely subjective level, it's as if the show was custom-made specifically to slightly irritate me. I don't like that all characters in this show are assholes. I don't like how the radio cast look like mobsters or serial rapists. I don't like that she looks like a serial rapist. I don't like that they draw these weird shadows on their eyes except when they don't for some reason. I don't like the main heroine who just blabbers on and on and on, making me nauseous trying to actually follow the story. I don't like the comedy of the show either, that's while better than most comedies I've watched is predictable and stale. And by episode 8 I've just started tuning out of this plane of existence and think about various important life questions everyone thinks, like can goats hate? Can cats feel betrayed? For how much would I suck a dick of a 70 year old? And at episode 10, when they've pretty much concluded her arc and all that stuff, after I have realized that there's two more episodes for me to sit through, I decided, you know what? This ain't worth it. If I've wanted to listen to a bunch of people I dislike arguing about stuff, I would go on Twitter or Discord. There is something magical in that feeling when the anime grabs you. Not even sure how to describe it, really. It's like that feeling when you see a starving cat and a pair of kittens and buy them food, or when the kill animation in a video game gives a satisfying crunch, or when the woman you're dating has a kid so that you know how much saw blades you have to take. But I digress. It's also peculiar that the animes I genuinely enjoyed this year apparently also have a contest on the longest and most obnoxious title ever created. It was villainous the last season, and now this. Just look at this shit. Gaze upon its girth! You know what? To make this more comedic, I'll call it Rucola Pizza. So, Rucola Pizza is a 13 episode power fantasy anime created by Studio Silverling that belongs to the type of animes whose plot is basically its title. There once was a demon lord Anus. He was big, he was strong, he was manly. He got stabbed by a sword and the wound from that all got all demons and humans divided. Then 2000 years later he rest, got all big in a month and got snazz, so he went to a bar that as a practical joke he decided to enroll in a school. God, I hate poetry. Anyway, Big Demon Lord got resurrected 2000 years later and is now basically wiping the floor with everything. Imagine Overlord if Ainz was the one and only character doing anything of note. And by gods, I loved every minute of it. The characters' personalities are interesting enough for me to actually sit down and cheer them on on their journey. Anos is a protagonist that I can perfectly see why people would like. He's confident, he's smug, he's... Well, the Demon Sisters story arc was an interesting one, and the solution was a bit underwhelming. Okay, the bad guys of the show had an average looking design, their motivations were one note, and they just folded door with barely any resistance. Admittedly, maybe my impressions of it are slightly colored by the previous 2-3 weeks of me watching things I hated, so this anime was basically my detox, but still it does an admirable job for what it tries to be, and that is a silly, stupid power fantasy anime. It exists solely for you to sit down comfortably, preferably after a hot bath, and watch it until you get tired of it, for me it's roughly 5-6 to six episodes a day, and then be happy about life for a brief moment before you remember where you are. The characters are inoffensive and take enough screen time to not be entirely overshadowed by Anos. The ending twist was kinda obvious, but they've played it in a tacit way. The overall story of Demon Lord is good and every bad guy is basically an elitist and or racist is mentioned only when needed, so it doesn't attract too much attention. The graphics are average for this sort of show, an occasional lip-syncing issue aside, the music is barely there, with only notable thing about it being the opening song that was sung by a guy and I think two episodes? Still, don't quote me on that, the opening itself was so boring that male vocals was the only reason I've even bothered to remember them. Now that I think about it, I've really oversold this anime, did I? Essentially, there's nothing really to say about it, nor a good way to conclude it, as it is what it is. In a way, I can respect that more than something like listeners. It's like the difference between an eatery where they serve you a nice bowl of old-fashioned mashed potatoes and cheese, and an elite restaurant where they say tell you the exact same mashed potatoes and cheese, only it's overpriced, the portion is smaller, and for some reason the name is in Italian. It's not much, but you're guaranteed to get what you ordered at least. Meanwhile, in the other one, the waiter doesn't even look like Mario, which I'm more than certain breaks some sort of law. I once saw a picture on the internet from the times when furry fandom was in its infant days, and the debate on whether they're just cartoon anthropomorphic animals enthusiasts or a bunch of weird sex cultists was a seriously discussed topic. This message in general wasn't that much special, but the end particularly struck me. You can do all of those things 
things, yet all you choose to do with them is draw them naked. And as time passes, I feel that the topic of Monster Girls can also be described as such, or alternatively, the place all character cliches go to die. At the very least, that's probably the third time I've seen these cliches being coded into these exact Monster Girls, so there has to be something weird in there. Monster Girl Doctor is a 12-episode cunt-curbing harem fantasy anime developed by Arvo Animation, who for reasons unknown I subconsciously want to call Arian Animation, that tells us the story of Glenn Leadbite, a human doctor that specializes in treating monster people. Fun fact, I have read the manga until a certain point, and this anime once again reminded me one of the biggest advantages manga has over anime, your own imagination and biases. When I was reading it, I've imagined a different story from the ones shown in the anime. I've imagined Glenn as a workaholic doctor that wants to do good to the detriment of everything else. What the anime shows is perfectly demonstrated in the opening narration that tells us the epic tale about the racial holy war between monsters and humans that is immediately followed by the main hero groping the shit out of some minor titty. Welcome to about 95% of the jokes in this anime, by the way. The other 75% are about Glenn being so indifferent to women's charm, I genuinely think he's asexual, hence why this is cunt curbing. And then there's the other part of the anime, the harem members. Three of the characters are basically slightly tweaked characters from Monster Musume, that being the obsessive childhood friend Lamia, the bratty noble centaur woman, and the shy blacksmith Cyclops. As you can see, the biggest tweaking of the formula was the inclusion of the childhood friend and Watakushi stereotypes. Others are a bit more original, that is true, but for the most part, they too are nothing too special to mention, other than Arachnia, who is both an Arachna and a fashion designer. Slow down with the creativity there, Monster Doctor, we still haven't gotten used to it after Bordella Reviewer. The graphics of the show are kinda weird to describe. On screenshots, they don't look too bad, one can even confuse them for just a regular 2D drawing, but there is 3D here, only it's so blended into the style, it's noticeable only in small, almost minuscule scenes you're not really supposed to pay a lot of attention to. But the result of that is a weird Uncanny Valley-esque feeling of seeing the part that is clearly 3D, realizing that it is 3D and failing to register it as such. The music is, to put it diplomatically, about as interesting as listening to grass grow. Another continent. I am sensing a sort of theme for this season, but it's honestly hard to really conclude anything about this anime. I can't say it's a bad anime on a purely technical level, graphical quirks aside, yet I can't find much to talk about it either. There is nothing to recommend here, nothing to take in, nothing to explain or show to your friends other than the weird images of the main hero groping a monster girl in a lewd way. But why on God's green earth would I want to see it for that when I could just go play Monster Girl Quest or read Monster Girl Encyclopedia or just do any other Monster Girl related thing with porn in it? It's only saving grace was the medicinal part of it, but there's nothing there. The amount of doctor stuff he did could be just as accurately discerned from reading a wiki about specific animal treatment, and that's probably the main reason behind my disappointment. Imagine that you were invited by a girl to her place, her expecting to get with you all close and personal, but you're not really interested in her, you're more interested in her buff hunk of a dad, and I mean, what can I say? I'm both cunning and prefer humans who do physical activities. An interesting creature is an anime based on something foreign, I wonder what other people usually see in it. Let's say for example that for reasons unknown some famous Japanese studio had decided to adapt your local work as their own. How are you going to feel about it? A sense of patriotic pride that finally something from your culture has been spotted by the Japanese? A sense of dread when you realize that a studio adapting it is made out of one dude and a freezer full of expired pudding? A sense of aggressive indifference because you didn't even know your country made this thing in the first place? Well, if Radiant, all the old anime based on American literature and this new god of high school has taught me anything is that without knowing beforehand that the source material isn't Japanese, you're not going to feel a lot of difference. Sure, the names aren't the exact same and there are quirks, but skip all of that and they might as well be adapted from some indie light novel. Incidentally, God of High School is a 13 episode anime developed by MAPPA based on a popular South Korean webtoon of the same name about a 17 year old Taekwondo user Jin Mori and his ragtag group of friends enrolling into an epic martial arts tournament, but little do they know that behind the facade of an innocent test of might lies a deep and sinister it's magic. And the story quickly devolves into teenagers with superpowers fighting God. And Jin himself is... Well, in order to not spoil it entirely, just imagine a popular mythological character from the East who is super famous, super strong, and featured in fucking everything up to brand dildos. Yes. That character. The plot of the show can be safely described as a tournament arc in a shonen, and it wouldn't be even that much of an insult. We have a cast of colorful characters with interesting fighting styles, kicking the shit out of each other and learning whatever it is they need to become stronger and whatever else they need to do. The biggest and the most original thing about God of Soggy Trousers is that unlike pretty much every other shonen anime, it doesn't faff around and cuts straight to the chase. The show's pace is almost breakneck, fights are quick, monologues and dialogues are kept to the most functional bare minimum, and the story is pretty much as easy to digest as they come. And that's both the 
the weakest and the strongest point of the show. I can perfectly imagine a person that likes this sort of presentation, it's probably going to be the same guy that likes when a harem protagonist isn't a floor mat or a shared sex toy and he would be overjoyed by seeing everything he sees, that the fighting is quick and doesn't get interrupted by monologues or people unlocking some second wins or some pointless story about the character that we'll only see in this arc is very sad, such a person will remember this anime as being very cool and how all anime tournaments should go in the future, what more could you possibly wish for, you stubborn knob? Well, for starters, the part about it not doing second wins and pointless stories is a blatant lie. Sure, you can argue that the marriage episode was required for character development, but it doesn't change the fact that it was basically a waste of an episode. Then we go to the later parts of the show, where the main hero masters the also important technique of pulling stuff out of his ass the moment the show can't just give him a cheap win. And that's me also being generous and not mentioning the backstories of other contestants few people would give a shit about. And this isn't me criticizing the show, mind you, there is a reason for why everything the way it is. If they would cut anything more out of it, it might as well be just a string of music videos with fight scenes. But that's my biggest problem with the show. In trying to make it as streamlined of an experience as possible, they had to ditch the traditional character development, you know, the reason why all of those tournament fights have long monologues that go for three seven episodes per fight. The story isn't hard to grasp, but only the main trio gets the required characterization moments, whilst others get scraps at best and are just window dressings at worst, never to be seen again after an episode. So to summarize, if you just want to see people punching each other with some cool music, then this is the anime for you. People who care about the story may be slightly interested, but not overly impressed, and people who like something more substantial will see basically a string of fight scenes with a dime store plot about gods and shit. It could be worse, I suppose. Could be an anime about mandatory penis inspections. Oh dearie me, Andy is going to see now about porn animes. Quick, gather around and start betting on how many liters of diarrhea will he pour onto it this time. Bonus money if the only reason for it is that it is a comedy anime, because heaven forbid people laugh in times like these. If you came here with these thoughts in mind, well, I have to disappoint you, dear listeners, because I actually liked these two animes. Gasp! But before you start heading into bunkers, hear me out, because these likes have so many asterisks that from space it looks like a weird allusion to Stonehenge. So Peter Grill and the Philosopher's Time is a short format 13 episode fantasy comedy anime about the aforementioned Peter Grill winning the tournament for the strongest person in the world that now every single race, and I quote, seeks the seed of the strongest warrior to continue their respective bloodlines, or in simpler terms, wants him to impregnate a bitch to create the next Superman. All while Peter himself just wants to date a girl so innocent and pure that I think she'll run away crying the second she'll even imagine a penis. And it's a fun premise, ultimately. Simple as well. Peter likes a girl, but he's also very horny. So he gets raped by women, and now he has to hide it or else his father-in-law will do something horrible to him. Straight to the point, and leaves enough room for imaginative scenes to be played just the way I like my comedies to be. And because of the theme, the show also gets to be erotic as well. Though if you're watching the censored version, erotic is probably a slight exaggeration. In that case, the show is even funnier, because then it implies that in this fantasy world, women's naked body is basically a permanent source of light. But, well, the diarrhea tank is expensive to rent, so I'll have to use it in one way or another. For starters, the premise is simple, which means that it gets predictable very fast. Most of the show manages to straddle around it by being basically three, four normal length episodes stretched into seven, but after that the joke about Peter's poor faith becomes a bit overdone and you start to either just pity the bastard or be irritated that he's basically another spineless coward of a protagonist. In terms of harem, only two women are properly introduced, with the last one, the orc girl, just spawning near him with little if any exploration of her story and motivations for needing Peter's seed. All in all, start strong for a comedy anime, peters out by the end. But it's stupid enough to get some enjoyment out of it, and it's short, so it doesn't require that much of a time investment. And speaking of time investment, The Titan's Bride is a yaoi isekai anime about a Japanese high school boy that gets transported into a kingdom of giants and gets wedlocked by a giant prince into being his bride. Then the show enacts the usual affair for these sorts of plots. The rich and influential masculine stereotype sets a certain date for the meek and feeble feminine stereotype in which one has to attract the other or release one from captivity but he can't do anything without her permission, which translated from horny means I'm going to sexually assault you until the Stockholm Syndrome kicks in. The anime is nine episodes long, each lasting for about six minutes, out of which one or two are dedicated to the end credits in which the episode is going on fast forward, probably in case you were too busy masturbating to actually follow the story. And there's really nothing much to follow here. What I've said before pretty much covers it all. The main character
character who dreams about girls and shit eagerly starts to write his husband's cock somewhere in episode 5, and it's here that I understood that the plot is pretty much of no value at all, because if you judge it purely by the story, it's incredibly rushed and lacks that sort of padding other shows like these tend to have. From actual sex perspective, I honestly wasn't impressed. I mean, they fuck, alright? But the censorship in it makes it look pretty tame in comparison even to Peter Grills and downright Christian kid-friendly in comparison to regular hentai, where the women's vagina would've probably gotten rendered at every possible angle, including the insides. It's one of those animes that I honestly recommend to cut and turn into a feature-length episode, because even though it's short, I feel I would make a disservice to my audience in recommending it, even as a fat material. I do think that the story has its potential in an ancient Magus Bride sort of way, but as it is, it is just mediocre yaoi porn. Well, at least now the mandatory penis inspections are over. Well, it's about time we concluded this season, and before the pretty much inevitable re-zero, we will see now about two animes that I was interested in personally solely because of their descriptions, Decadence and Gibiate. So I guess the theme of this episode is going to be animes whose main enemy names start with letter G. Decadence is an original 12-episode sci-fi anime developed by Not that tells us a story about how humanity fucked over the ecology so badly that humans have gone practically extinct. Well, that and the usual evil monsters that probably are supposed to represent something, so a corporation literally bought the rights for owning the remaining humans humanity put them into a massive moving city called Decadence, and they, along with their cyborg warriors called Gears, now have to fight these monsters called God all over their very survival. <laughs> nah, just kidding. In actuality, Decadence is a massive theme park built for cyborgs, with humans being basically NPC slash zoo exhibits, and the entire point of the show is the exploration and subversion of the system. So far, so predictable. In fact, when I saw the poster for it, some memories of Darling in the Sex Shop and listeners came back to me, like that chicken nugget you forgot under the sofa comes back to you when the seasonal cleaning starts. Starts. And we might as well categorize Decadence and the same general genre of punky moralistic anime, but for once I actually liked what I've seen. It's not a mecha anime, for starters. Outside of Decadence, the whole aesthetic reminds me more of a mix between Mad Max and Attack on Titan, and since I've remembered those two, here's how Decadence doesn't fuck everything up like those two did. One, it is never obtuse with what it wants to show you, darling. Two, it doesn't pretend to have a deeper meaning than it actually has, listeners. Three, the story gradually opens up to show us all the cool bits, thus all the emotional moments have greater Wait, and the ending is both optimistic and makes sense, darling and listeners. But well, this show is called Anti Rambles About, not Anti Praises Everything, gotta point everything bad about it. Decadence's story might be a little too straight and easy to understand for my liking. A lot of the plot points are very obvious, which makes the emotional moments fall flat on their face. This doesn't sound like that bad of a flaw, except characters die in this story, and when the viewer can see the death flag telegraphed about two, three episodes before the actual death, it becomes boring. The music could also be a bit more memorable, though I'm not the type of snob that expects every anime to have the of Gynax, would it kill people to actually try something more imaginative than generic trumpets and electric guitars? Oh, and the graphics are okay. Nice, don't get me wrong, but nothing too special. In short, though I liked the anime greatly, in retrospect I only remember a handful of moments from it, mostly a couple of story beats in the middle and towards the end, and everything else is a forgettable slur of a generic fight the power story with some cool action scenes. I can safely assume that this anime will fall into the underrated category of animes, given that ReZero came in the same season. And now Gibiate. Even just mentioning that name sounds like me bullying the show. It went with no fanfare, and most of the things I've read about it just screams development hell to me, which, if I was a much more kinder person, would make me feel bad about featuring it here, but thankfully, like French radicals during democratic elections, my heart is all about negativity and angst. So here we go. Chibiate is the sort of anime I love to ramble about because it is bad. None of that wishy-washy mediocrity where I have to admit that the graphics are nice or that it is just mecha and therefore was made for people I would probably despise in real life. This is just all bad all the time, to the point where it honestly becomes impressive to witness. I have to honestly be in awe of the weight behind the contracts of everyone involved in the production of this thing to not only stamp their names onto this, but to also legally distribute it. I mean, where do I even begin? With the animation so cheap it makes children's anime look good? With the 3D animation that even on screenshots manages to look like a bunch of off-brand action models? With the monster design that looks like something I can find on a Unity asset store? With the music that reeks of budget cuts? Stuff like this is what shows like Pop Team Epic parodied. But now let's talk about the plot, which is the biggest problem of this train wreck. The show is about a girl that Wikipedia claims to be a scientist, but I'll be fucked if the show ever mentioned that, and do do dudes from Warring States period living in a post-apocalyptic Tokyo trying to find a cure against the Gibia virus, which is basically an aggressive mega-cancer. There are also other characters, but they all are spear carriers destined to die soon after their backstory is explained, and that's pretty much it. They run around Tokyo, get barely anything done, most of them 
die anyway, and in the end it's all aliens, there's no cure, there's no hope, and it all ends on a cliffhanger. And that wouldn't be that much of an issue if the stories were good or at the very least thematic, but not really. There's no point in them being warriors from old Japan, there's no point for the Doctor to stay silent about Meteora, there's no point in our main girl being dressed like a wannabe idol or a hooker. Gibiate is an animated reeks of author, a pet project, something that was made for designers' sake than the viewers. It proudly wastes money on an opening made by Yoshida Brothers and other big Japanese names, and the end result of all of that is roughly comparable to watching a squirrel trying to blow up a pit bull, but the pit bull is sterilized and is a bitch. And so, if you can probably tell by my voice, I'm tired. That means everyone else around me is tired, and it's time for my mandatory week of sleeping. But before that, we'll have to finish it off with a last ramble on an anime I not only wanted to watch, but also actually give a shit about. ReZero, the anime whose story almost entirely consists of suffering, suffering, and as you younglings like to say these days, epic gamer moments. It's a shame that, like pretty much everything else in the world, COVID didn't spare Japan, so the promised second season is only 13 episodes long, and by the end I could see that they obviously wanted to do more. That or they really suck at making good cliffhangers. As per usual, I have to warn you, spoilers ahead, cause this is the second season of a show, so me not talking about the previous events is kinda like trying to describe elections in North Korea with an elaborate dance performance. Just watch it if you give a shit, might as well. You have the time to listen to me of all people, you're obviously not going to spend that time curing cancer or writing the next bestseller. So, ReZero is a story of Natsuki Subaru, a sort of regular Japanese schoolboy who gets transported into a fantasy world with a special ability to respawn after death and pretty much nothing else. So the rest of the anime centers around two things. Subaru being an irritating petty douchebag to people, and Subaru suffering every day, all the time, until either by his smarts or sheer dumb luck he overcomes his hurdle and sets a new checkpoint for himself. The second season begins soon after the first one. The big flying whale is dead, which the witch cultists effectively treat as a declaration of war, but until that, Emilia has to perform an epic ritual and Subaru has to help her do that, which in turn locks him in probably the hardest event so far, as well as allow him to meet new interesting eldritch monsters that wear skins of regular human girls. Well, after watching this season, I can safely say that it's pretty much the same as the first season in both positives and negatives. I would say that the characters are still the strongest point of the show in general. As much as I hate to admit it, Subaru's character is just that sympathetic enough for his dickishness to be explained and to some people may have even be justified, and others are basically acting the way you'd expect them to act. The introduction of witches properly into the story was slightly predictable, after all this is still an isekai anime, but the witches themselves were done pretty nicely and that they're just human enough to understand their actions, yet eldritch enough to understand why they have such a bad reputation. The music is also so very nice, especially during witch encounters, aka the scenes that really need a good track, and the graphics are about on the same level as they were before. Unfortunately, that it's pretty much the same as the first season also means that all the flaws are there as well. That is to say, if you didn't like Subaru in the first season, don't you like Subaru in this one either, as not only he gets incredibly whiny constantly, but also tends to act irrationally and forget things that would make his life a lot easier. The overall plot of the season also felt a bit convoluted for my tastes. While not incomprehensible, and everything gets explained by the and I get the feeling that people might get lost while trying to follow the story, it doesn't help that it also ends just when it gets interesting, and to balance the seriousness of the soul, all in all, I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to say about it, really. It's about what I expected, and if you longed for that ReZero fix, you won't be disappointed. People who didn't like it, though, will still dislike it, and the world will continue to roll around the sun until the inevitable entropy devours our soul. That or people will actually start being decent and kind to each other, one of the two. Well, it's the inevitable time of the year when I have roughly three to six weeks before every anime I give a shit about ends properly, so we have to pad it out with something, and this time this something is movies. Ugh. Let me be honest with you for a second, dear viewer. I've never been shy away from the fact that animation in general is the place I feel more comfortable, like a blind puppy feels inevitably more comfortable alongside his litter mates, and like a typical American suburbanite, stepping out of this comfort zone makes me either really paranoid or really racist. So why are you even doing this in the first place, Danny, I hear you asking, and to answer that question, I have to point out at the source of most of my problems, my employers, who in their infinite wisdom went to a film blog and entered a local movie night under my name, and since I hate having loose ends, I'm pretty much contractually obliged to watch at least four of the bloody things. And without further delaying, Coherence is an American film that Wikipedia proudly claims to be a surreal psychological science fiction thriller, a title I have many issues with, but we'll get to them later if I won't forget. So the film is about eight people you'll immediately forget after watching the movie, doing this sort of reuniting in a scene that is supposed to give you a feel of their characters, but instead made me realize that I want to see them dead on about fifth to sixth minute of the movie. These people are the type of people who in actual horror movies tend to be that bloke who 
acts all brave and constantly argues with the main group and dies later on, except here every person is like that and you genuinely have trouble believing that these people are friends in the first place. But anyway, a comet flies by and traps them in a sort of quantum time loop, which they quickly deduce will end after the comet flies by and actually poses no threat to them whatsoever, so instead of just shrugging, closing their doors and going to sleep, they start trying to interact with them with predictable results. I suppose now is the time to start talking about the technical issues. The movie is filled with that style of semi-professional shaky cam, which probably gave a lot of critics an erection, but to me it looks like the director couldn't decide on whether to do a found footage movie or a normal movie and went with a mix of both. The music feels extremely out of place in this movie, reminiscent of cheap horror games on Steam at best and emotionally manipulative at worst, and none of the characters feel in any way, shape or form sympathetic, not when they clearly manipulate each other and blurt things anyone with a deductive brain could figure out in about 25 minutes before them, and the ending is some woman just goes out of the house, finds a better one, tries to blend in and kinda fails doing so. A woman who wasn't really that likable in the first place, mind you. So to summarize, Coherence is a predictable, boring story with unlikable protagonists, a lame premise and a plot that could just as well be emulated by watching any of those TV shows about people sexing it up on an island, only without sex. And logic and chocolate. So let me tell you about Eddie the Eagle, one of three movies whose names were on a list that looked so soulless I chose this movie simply because the name at least gave me a vague idea about what to expect from it. And to say that I have gotten something I didn't expect was like saying Belgium wasn't expected to get invaded by Germans during World War II. Answer me this, dear listener. Have you ever watched a sports movie before? If yes, then congratulations, you have no reason to watch Eddie the Eagle unless you're masochistic or the spawn of Count von Count. But I'm getting a bit ahead of myself here. Eddie the Eagle is a bi biographical movie about Michael Edwards, a ski jumper that literally blundered his way up to British records and this alongside his goofy nature endeared him to people so much someone decided to make a movie about him. And that's about it, really. So not only this is a movie about sports, which is about as interesting to discuss as dried dog turds, it's also a biofilm. A BIOFILM! The only way I could be even more removed from any possible target audience this film has is if this film also featured scat fetish. Have I mentioned that this is a British movie, by the way? Well, not like I need to, really. Anyone that knows English will recognize the distinct Britishness of the movie and that everyone talks and acts in the timed English tradition of passive aggressiveness. This makes the movie a slog to go through. From the very start, the main character comes off like a blundering, borderline autistic tosspot with no concept of personal space or integrity, and I get that he's supposed to be endearing to the viewer in that starry-eyed romantic sort of way, but instead he comes off as, well, what I've described him before, and that the movie acknowledges it doesn't make it better. Then the predictable sports movie stuff gets piled onto this, you know the drill, the lack of support from one of the parents, usually the father, the cynical trainer who slowly develops a sort of buddy relationship with the protagonist, the frat boys whose sole purpose in life is to ruin our protagonist's day. In movie's defense, it's not that badly executed, there is a sort of chemistry between the characters that makes the viewing just tolerable enough for me to actually continue talking about the movie and not just replace the rest of my ramble with me trying to create a music track using only my tongue and one foot. But yes, in conclusion, I generally try to judge movies based on a simple criterion. If I had just stumbled upon this on the idiot box or the idiot service, would I wish to continue watching it and not just switch it off to something else? In case of Barry the Ostrich, no, I wouldn't. As a matter of fact, I don't think I liked the movie very much and I doubt a lot of people will like it either. Of course, if you like watching sports movies, then it's not the worst movie out there, as far as I could care, it does portray the sport faithfully, and if you want to know about the bloke, then I think it's also not as bad. The problem, that it's not as good either, and the only things you'll remember after watching it is the irritating main protagonist, that Hugh Jackman was the only guy walking in a short and freezing weather, and a Norwegian trainer named Bjorn, and I mean he most definitely looks like a Bjorn, alright? Huh. So that's why that sauna scene reminded me of an introduction to a gay porn movie. So in this episode of Anti Trice, his hardest to not fall asleep while trying to explain what the fuck he just watched, we have just one of the guys, an 80s American teen comedy cult classic that Wikipedia claims to be a loose adaptation of William Shakespeare's Twelfth Night, in the same way that the latest Avengers movies are a loose adaptation of Jonathan Swift's Modest Proposal. And, well, just one look at the cover of the movie shows all you need to know about it. It's an 80s comedy movie about high school, but other cliches and lighter that follows. In fact, I'm not even sure I'm qualified to really comment on the movie because I lived through not only that time in general, but that specific time in movie industry as well, which makes my takes on it seem fairly tame. Well, of course, 15 year old has a sex life. Heck, my school peers started bumping uglies with each other at the age 13 14, and girls were getting themselves pregnant since age 12. Of course, the dork who can't get sex looks like a fucking model. This is the 80s, 
baby. If you ain't beautiful, you ain't getting a role in the movie industry, at least in a way that doesn't involve you getting an invitation to a mysterious private island. Of course there are mandatory penis inspections in the school. This is the 80s, where boys' shower rooms were pretty much the gateway to discover your homosexuality. It's also the time where the word transvestite was just a way to describe cross-dressers and not necessarily a slur. Which is why I kinda wanna see a review of this movie from a modern human's perspective. You know the sort. The ones that are afraid to look at women for worries of cancellation, or those that see everything as a direct attack on their personality. At least they can say something more interesting than I ever could. But regardless, we follow the story of Terry Griffith, a journalist in training and a woman who is very sad that her article isn't getting to some big contest or something like that, so she decided to do what every rational person does, cross dresses and tries to peddle her article in another school and after failing there she befriends a dork and makes him into a macho man, falls in love in the process of doing that and then her friend finds that all out on a prom, again the 80s, gets mad for a brief moment and and doesn't want to be her friend anymore, she publishes her article, gets a ton of praise, that friend turns back again, and now they're lovers. Oh, and her brother gets sex. The end. There's not much to say here, but neither do you really need to say much. I can definitely get why this has a cult classic status. It shows a theme that even today people don't really like to discuss and turns it into a comedy that really speaks for itself. Whether that's good or bad, though, is up to interpretation. Most of the actors of this film are of B-stock at best that mostly work in episodic TV shows, and it really shows, not only in their slightly awkward acting, but also, for a lack of a better term, structure. Hard to explain something like this without going into film theory, but compare the flow, the direction, and filming tricks used in something like Coherence and this movie and you can clearly see the intended audience for each. Coherence is a theatrical movie, meant to be seen from the big screen like a big brother. This movie, on the other hand, is filmed for television, with ad breaks and all that stuff. And from that perspective, it's not a bad watch by any means. On its own, though, it's at best forgettable, at worst feels dated in every aspect. Like those relatives you forget why you and your parents rarely visited and after visiting them yourself you realize exactly why, repressed memories of shower molestation not included. Well, now that the movies are finally over and I'll try my damnedest to avoid such things and flagellate anyone in this facility to try otherwise, it's time for us to return to this seasonal garbage, or as I like to call it, sequels the season. Yeah, expect a lot of double features by the end, because there's not much original stuff to talk about, but a lot of continuations that have both come this season that I've skipped the last time. We'll begin with Talentless Nana, a 13 episode anime made by Studio Bridge, whose genre is hard to actually describe. Wikipedia claims it to be a suspense psychological thriller, and while I can see the logic behind such classification, it's hard to actually call it that now that I've seen it. Let me explain what I mean. Also, be prepared for some spoilers if retelling the plot of the first episode counts as that. We begin on a mysterious island in the middle of nowhere, to which the benevolent Japanese government sends mutant children to be trained against the so-called enemies of humanity. We're introduced to a typical nerd who thinks he doesn't belong in here and two new transfer students. Nana and, uh... The angry blonde dude. Shenanigans ensue where the nerd gets the position of the class leader... And then Nana throws him off a bridge. So, as per the usual rules of anime epicemitism, all pink-haired girls are either plot devices or cold-blooded killers, and Nana is in the latter category, being sent by the government to silently dispose of all the mutants on the island because in the retarded xenophobic government plan book, this is the third method of containing something after trying to silence the media and then trying to weaponize it. The main premise, and what people who like this anime will probably tell you is the whole point of the show, are mind games between the crafty detective and equally crafty killer, a sort of cat and mouse play where lives are wasted and the situation on an isolated island slowly escalates. People who aren't as easily impressed, though, will quickly see that all of that is smoke and mirrors in the end of the day. The characters have the intellectual capabilities of a budgery guard. The grumpy blonde kid basically knows Nana's the killer, with the only reason why he can't just go and apprehend her is due to his downright autistic desire to play it fair. And Nana's deductive skills may be impressive the first one two series, but soon turns from smarts to just sheer dumb luck. So instead, I chose to watch it as a slasher movie, and that honestly was more entertaining, as than ever bad about the mystery plot gets immediately explained by the confinements of the genre. So Nana is the indestructible slasher and everyone else is supposed to be stupid and unlikable because that's the point, you don't really sympathize with the heroes in these movies, you expect them to have sex and die in the most interesting of manners. Unfortunately this also didn't go for too long, as soon the plot about Nana getting empathy started and that's where the show officially lost me, mostly because it was used as a cheap to be continued intrigue. Though in show's defense, the last villain of the show was indeed a bit unexpected, though I have to add to that, anything is unexpected if you don't know what the fuck to expect. And that's another more structural problem with the entire premise. It's not as interesting to watch when the showmakers can just pull pretty much anything out of their bottomless rectum and call it canon, resulting in a feeling roughly described as... Eh. 
Which is probably the best way to describe Talentless Nana, a meandering, mediocre parade of predictable ideas and predictable executions of said ideas that ends on a cliffhanger that doesn't make me want to go search up the manga, but instead made me go search the animation studio, see that they're in charge of the 2020 man Shaman King reboot, and experience the feeling best described as irritated second-hand embarrassment. Though, let's be frank, most of the entertainment industry these days can be described as such. After the last week of anime blueballing, I want to talk about something that actually ends on a satisfying note, and not on a too be continued, or at the very least not as blatant. I've watched the first season of I'm Standing on One Million Lives, and though I was impressed by it, I don't think it's the right time to discuss it, mostly because I think my impressions on it would be incomplete without a second season and I don't want it to be another Nana. It's like the episode format in video games. <laughs> yeah, remember those? Those are fucking horrible times, when they released a snippet of content and then you had to pray to actually continue making the damn thing and not just go bankrupt or run away with your money. Same story, different medium. So instead, let's talk about Wandering Witch, The Journey of Alina. Talk about premature ejaculation. The journey of Elena... Elena... Fuck it. The Journey of Angela Merkel is a 12-episode fantasy adventure anime made by Studio C2C that tells us one of my favorite types of fantasy story of the hero traveling the world for god knows what reason and meeting strange and peculiar shit along the way. It's also one of the few subgenres of visual storytelling that is simultaneously hard and easy to fuck up, because to make a good, let's call it travel or anime, you have to nail three crucial aspects. One, the places the character goes to have to be interesting to look at. Two, the characters our protagonist meets have to be at least slightly sympathetic. Three, the protagonist himself needs to be at least slightly sympathetic, or at the very least interesting to watch. So now that we've established our criteria, let's test. The story begins with young Angela Merkel reading a book about the adventures of her mother traveling around the world, to which Angela Merkel herself seemed to be oblivious to, even though it is telegraphed with the crazy agility of mustard gas bombardment. Then she trains to be a witch, gets a little bit of character development, a pat on the back, and off she goes. From this point onward, her character will never change ever again. I would want to say the usual polite, it's really hard to quantify defy Angela Merkel's character, but no, it's really not. She's a cunt. A big, flappy, self-aggrandizing cunt, whose ego is probably the size of Copenhagen and probably houses an equally cunty population of cunts. Throughout the series, she mostly has one emotion, which I like to call the European concern, mostly watches the predictably tragic events unfold, and should the events fall under her internal suffering quota, she actively gives advices to them on how to suffer harder. And I already hear you bastards slithering in the comment section telling me, Andy, it's not that bad. She does have a tragic moment to, and the final episode was pretty much about her confronting her egotistical behavior and showing that those moments did affect her. To which I say, yes, confronting and coming victorious in the end. So not only she learned jack shit, she's actively rewarded for being a cunt. The locations she visits aren't that impressive either, they look like a mix of Central and South Central Europe, where every city is treated like its own state and the suspiciously fractured and current looking fonts only confirm this. I did like them though, but it's mostly because I like that historical period, and even then every city after the third episode started looking too gimmicky for my taste, and other characters are roughly categorized in two neatly divided halves. The ones you're supposed to give a shit about, aka the ones that literally steal the episode away, and the rest of the untouchables that get immediately forgotten in about half an episode or so. And don't get me started on the pitiful attempts at humor that more often than not looked out of place. But if you allow me to strip my grumpy pants for a moment, I do understand why people would like Angela Merkel. If I was to describe the show in one word, I guess that word would be enough. It mixes enough colorful and dark moments so that people who don't really think critically when watching anime get fulfilled, it's relaxing enough that the dark moments can catch you off guard, and ultimately I guess Angela Merkel is a likable enough protagonist to root for, though this one has more to do with the fact that most anime watching audience are about as dumb, selfish and egotistical as her. As far as I'm concerned though, it is an average travel anime with a protagonist I want to smother with a pillow, and pretty much nothing else besides it, so basically this anime represents my secret desires on what I would do to other people that watch anime. Once upon a time I was watching a movie that I actually kind I liked on a purely technical level. The camera work was fine, the acting was tolerable, I didn't want to fall asleep while watching it, all was nice and cozy until it dawned me, wait a second, I've exclaimed, this isn't a good movie, this is a one hour long porn movie about an American actor that tries to copy Schwarzenegger's accent, having his way with a 25 year old black actress that plays the role of his 18 year old stepsister. Not only am I not erect, this film is also not really that impressive as I thought it was. So yes, the theme of today's C note at the is animes that I've watched and could probably recommend in a more casual environment, but will probably extensively fart on during this ramble like a particularly flatulent elephant. <laughs> Mm. 
By the grace of God, is a 12-episode isekai anime developed by Maho Film, whose defining characteristic could be summarized by the story premise. A guy working for a black company dies, gets reborn as an overpowered blessed wonder boy, so he spends the following three years living in a cave playing with slimes, and then he meets some nice people that return him to civilization. What, is that all? Yep. Pretty much it. In Cho's defense, its approach in regards to the whole isekai business is slightly better than other shows I care to remember and that the mechanics of it are explained and there is a visible influence on the world from the previous batch of superpowered weirdos. The plot isn't that complex, all things considered, and neither are character interactions. In fact, it was so inoffensively average, I struggle to even say what I like or dislike about it, mostly because I already forgot most of the show. Oh no, I remembered now. I really didn't appreciate the usual Japanese approach to the show's gimmick, where the guy demonstrably wrecks havoc and everything, but it's not appreciated because it's not cool enough or something like that. You know, your rising of the shield heroes, irregular at a magic academy and whatever else. In this anime, slimes are discriminated against because they are a low-level mob, even though the main protagonist's entire gimmick is that he vomits slime all over the place and even uses slime in everyday tasks so much it's impressive this world hasn't converted into a slime punk world by now. Anyway, the anime is a nice and inoffensive little thing that I liked enough to recommend to people that just want to relax, but at the same time I have to warn people that you'll forget about it in about a day or so after the last episode. Moving on. Continuing its ongoing Korean fever, Crunchyroll gives us its quote-unquote original with a very unfortunate name of the Darling variety. Contextually, I think Nobles is a more appropriate way to say it, but it can also be called Noblesse or simply Nobles, so to spare you the confusion, I shall call it the only appropriate name, Nobles. Nobles is a 13-episode anime developed by Production IG, whose stated genre is dark fantasy, but I prefer to call it a streamlined shonen anime. Basically, there's this dude who is the aforementioned Nobles, a being whose lack of a knob gives him superpowers beyond any possible belief, which is why he bumbles around at his personal high school with his human friends. Besides him, there are also people he likes that eventually form a community around him, and uh, do you even give a shit at this point? Big strong man is big and strong, and others are pretty much the stars of the show. It's one punch man, only less self-aware. Before I continue, I have to explain some things, lest be I accused of not being fair to the show. The show itself is absolutely okay in a technical sense of the term. It is watchable and it does everything it needs to do as far as the genre is concerned. The characters are memorable enough, other than the Noblesse himself whose defining character moments is that he is very stunted emotionally, but even that is not that much of a novelty these days. My biggest criticism of the show in general would be pretty much the same one I had for God of High School and that it feels rushed, but considering that they've crammed three volumes into 13 episodes that is to be expected, the reason why I sound like I don't want to talk about this anime is because I hardly need to. It is a shonen anime with epic characters, epic power levels, and all those other cool stories that is fun to watch, so I can definitely understand why it's popular, but if you seriously sit down and try to explain it to another person, the result will be very boring, annoying, and honestly not worth the time spent. And now, an insight into the thought process of your favorite anime rambler. Hatred, hatred, hatred. Black tea is best when you put some bits of frozen cherries into the water, so you have a compote tea mix. Hatred. Watch anime. But which anime? I'm running out of things I want to watch already, other than that one OVA from the author of Bleach, pretty much everything else is a movie continuation of the thing I watched before. Oh, and I suppose the Chinese cartoon about a person being good at video games, a skill as impressive and important to human development as those worm things from candy stripers are important to candy industry. Food recipes. Hatred. Alright, so which of the three movies I should watch? Right now I'm in the mood for something sad. I could watch Violet Evergarden, but to be honest I'm not in the mood for the type of sad it offers. Right now I'm more into a very specific visceral sadness of children suffering because of adults' actions. Hmm. Well, made in abyss it is then. Hatred, is it pedophilia if the person derives pleasure from torturing children? Honeyed pancakes with canned meat and ketchup are tasty. Made in Abyss is an anime made in 2017 that I already have a video about, which besides the painful realization that I've been doing this for at least five to six years by now, also documents my original thoughts on the anime itself, which were mostly positive. The studio has decided to continue the story in a movie format, but thankfully they also made two movies that are basically a compilation of the series, so if you've never watched the series proper before that, but for some reason the title Dawn of the Deep Soul had stroked some primordial interest in you, I sincerely recommend you go and watch the previous two movies as well. Every important thing from the anime series is there, minus the fluff, so in terms of a proper movie it will feel slightly rushed in terms of character 
character development, but other than that, it was a pretty enjoyable watch that shows children and horrible amounts of pain due to their rash actions. Also spoilers in case if that wasn't obvious enough. And speaking of children and pain, the suffering continues as Rico, Reg and Nanachi descend into the fifth layer of the abyss to face off with Bondrude, a white whistle that we already know to be not a very good person and soon we'll see that he is not a very good person indeed, even if his existence is needed for multiple reasons. Now forgive me if I'll go into conspiracy here for a moment, I think that Bondrude is the exact reason why this was made as a movie instead of another season. After watching it all, I've come to realize that the movie wanted the audience to hate Bondrude, something which the movie does well, but in an episodic format, a lot of the scenes would have to be reshuffled, padded, and on one occasion remade to do the same effect. You may think that this is a bit dramatic, and to be honest, the interaction between Prushka, Bondrude, and Rico feels a bit rushed in retrospect, something that could've used more padding to actually make us feel more for the character, but that's what I mean by reshuffled and padded. Different formats require different ways to convey the same information, and given the massive presence Bondrude has, the choice to make it more concise is a fairly logical one. But character interaction aside, the technical aspect has remained more or less unchanged. The graphics are still gorgeous and are extremely detailed and poop, dick drawings and suffering just as they were before. The music is still the same awesome vocals that are more reused at this time with only one track that I felt was new, but I'm just nitpicking at this point, am I? The movie is a nice addition to the series that needs a bit of padding to make it really good, but the answer to the eternal question is yes, Dawn of the Deep Soul is fun to watch. The action escalates as the story proceeds, the villain is both despicable and somewhat sympathetic at the same time, the characters suffer both emotionally and physically and actually toughen up from their interactions with the world, making you root for them. It doesn't really bring anything new to the table, but neither does it really needs to. It's like a semolina porridge. Everyone had one of those at least once and everyone loves semolina. It's both savory and can be used to make sweets and such. Food, food, hatred, insert a relevant social and or political joke... Uh, here. Having the privilege of being long-lived certainly gives you an insight on things, doesn't it? Especially in this day and age of fast-paced interconnected world where eras are shorter than the average rat's attention span and things that were considered to be revolutionary and world-changing are forgotten about faster than a politician forgets about his election promises. My first impression of the new season of King's Avatar was a very damning one. My first thought was, did they change the voice actor for the main hero, while the other one was, I don't remember who any of these people are, and I already could hear my editor's sigh of relief because this is most likely going to be a pretty short episode. Well, before I continue on the second season, I have to talk briefly about the movie as well. You know, to cover everything and piss off my editors. The movie is a prequel to the series in general. The excellent era team is but a bunch of Chinese young adults trying their luck at this new cyber sport thing, and the story is a fairly predictable but serviceable story of them rising to the top. Every important cliche is there. You have a tragic death of a team member, the unruly team member that first bails out and then returns to save the day, and the epic rivalry with a Russian boxer that is taller than you and, uh, <clears throat> Hmm, excuse me. Anyway, the movie is a fairly decent one, but I recommend you watching it before the actual series, as it will give the beginning of the story more weight, as well as more context on our main protagonist and the girl that might as well be the second protagonist. The second season is basically more of the same, to the point where I could just copy what I've said in my first ramble and you wouldn't spot any difference. I still don't understand how the game functions, the main hero still trolls everyone on the server, the graphics are still good except when they put 3D models alongside 2D drawings. There are some changes though, the first season's team of quirky chuckle fucks got dumped for most of the show and there is more emphasis on the professional side of cyber sports than the previous season for all that's worth. So I guess if you liked the first season you'll probably like this as well. People who like Japanese sports anime will probably also like this one, though I have to give you a warning that the atmosphere of this one is much more professional than Japanese one. You know how the vast majority of Japanese sports anime are more focused on the character drama, right? Like you have your new promising star that slowly establishes a report and tries its best to compete with other teams and or rivals within their own team, all that. Even sports animes that go into more detail about the professional scene are usually about the lives of their players. King's Avatar is not really about that. Sure, the story mostly follows Yeshu and his establishment of Happy Team, but this is only a part of a larger drama in the glory itself. Do you know EVE Online? A spreadsheet simulator that on occasion gives us news of epic battles with thousands of real-world money being wasted. This is what I'm reminded of when watching King's Avatar, a world of professional players rivaling with each other, creating and breaking alliances 
audiences dealing with business and marketing, and I'm sure there's an audience for such a thing, but I'm clearly not the type of people the show is catered to. People working in anything professional are some of the most soulless motherfuckers in the soulless capitalist globe, because this is what makes them professional, the act of desire to waste years of your life training to the point of ruining your mind and body, only to then be used by people specialized in deceit and manipulation, and then be discarded once you can't perform the required tasks. But I digress. Basically, the Donghua exists. There, could have saved a lot of time by ending on that. Making this ramble fills me with a sense of dread, similar to the one you have after sex and remembering that one of you forgot to put protection on, because I kinda realize where this will inevitably go for most people, and frankly the anime's connection to Bleach makes it kinda worse, because it opens up a can of worms in terms of world building so large that I don't even want to think about the implications. But then again, people who think that this ruins Bleach or something have clearly never seen the fucking later episodes where Ichigo stabs God. But enough of this, because God knows Kubo doesn't give a shit and neither should I. Burn the Witch is a feature-length movie, or a three-episode OVA, depending on where you're watching it, made by Studio Colorido that takes place in the world of Bleach, only instead of being in Japan, it's in jolly old UK London that has a parallel called Reverse London, whose defining feature is that it has dragons, and our heroes work for the agency that deals with dragons that aren't dragons in a typical sense and more like weird spiritual thingies. And to be honest, this less reminds me of Bleach and more reminds me of a weird mix of Soul Eater and Harry Potter. But anyway, our two main heroes work in a division dedicated to conserving and harvesting dragons, which we see them do in that typical action movie style of destroying private property as a collateral, then we're introduced to the obligatory doofus, who is in actuality a dragon clad, whose purpose in the story I failed to understand from the movie, other than that he can give regular humans the ability to see dragons. The story kicks in when the leaders of this organization declare the doofus to be an existential threat to Reverse London, and then one of the leaders, which to me seems like a bit of an overkill, personally goes to detain him by attracting a person with a dragon from another London which in turn appears to be the most epic and destructive dragon of them all. Then they all fail to stop them, after which some bearded guy snipes the dragon that is supposed to be this super serious trouble, and then the story ends. <sighs> what the heck do you expect me to even say about this? I guess that it feels a bit rushed, and the decision to split it into three episodes feels like a moronic one because it now feels like the studio got bankrupt in the middle of production and this was thrown in to recuperate loss. No, no, I guess I know exactly what to say here, that it reminds me of that Little Witch Academia movie, or that film about dragon dentists, the ones that weren't supposed to be anything other than a neat little idea to make, so we don't really need to extract any sort of meaning from them other than it looks cool. And as far as that criteria is concerned, I guess it looks cool indeed. The characters are nothing memorable, but they serve their purpose, the graphics are nice to look at, and the music is... kinda there? Not really that notable. The world itself looks interesting enough to want to see more about it, even if the ending plot twist about it being a branch of Soul Society opens a lot more questions than it probably should, and what's most important, everything about it is cohesive, at least as far as these animes tend to get. There are dragons, dragons are dangerous, there are people that fight dragons. They're a story for the ages we can all get behind. So at the end of all that, as a proof of concept it does its job, I'm into Burn the Witch enough to want the second act, but at the same time I don't think I can sincerely recommend it, especially since the second season is allegedly in production. Its opening is not as engrossing as Bleach and not as hilarious as Soul Eater, and if I were to judge it on its own merits, then I'd simply say I've seen this before already, and then make choo-choo noises with my mouth. I advise you people to just sit and wait for either the following movies or the inevitable anime adaptation. If you can't do that, then I advise you to make some mashed potatoes, pour a lot of peas into them, and then imagine a word heart being written in the middle of it. In case if you've suffered amnesia lately, Fire Force is an anime released last year whose defining characteristics was that the the main character had flamethrowers for legs and that the main villain could literally stop time using the heat of the universe or something like that. From the creator of Soul Eater, no less, which we can see by the main hero looking pretty much like the Soul Eater's main hero. Truly the most daring of innovations indeed. But yes, the story is about Earth after a radical global warming where people are known to spontaneously combust. Our main hero is enlisted into the newly created 8th Fire Force Department, whose sole purpose is to be a wild card at the political games between various factions of the Tokyo Empire, all while there's a a being called Evangelist that runs a sort of mix between Crusaders and Isis who want to destroy Tokyo for reasons I still yet fail to really understand. What I shall tentatively call the plot of Fire Force 2 continues the trend started in Fire Force 1 of writing down a whole bunch of only vaguely connected story elements and then flapping its hands and gargling spitballs. The real mystery of the plot isn't the grand schemes and revelations, but trying to guess what sort of bullshit will the author throw at the heroes next. Like seriously, first they try making some sort of revelations on the adulling that they fail to deliver on, then they meet the crazy 
sexy pink haired girl slash boy thing that they fail to secure, then they go to China, find another super powered plant there, then these two chuckle fucks raid the holiest of temples with fuck all results, then the main heroes raid Google headquarters with the only result being them allying with them, guess property damage is the best way to ensure friendly relations in this world, then they raid the nether and I'm not even sure what they got out of it, and then a training montage and a very spooky moon, a Saul Eater reference. The end. The show's biggest flaw in terms of execution is that it is tonally confused and flip-flops from being serious to being goofy, often in the same episode or where it doesn't need to be. To demonstrate what I mean by it, let's play a little game I like to call This Is Silly. I shall retell to you a part of the plot without any context and you'll decide if this is a filler episode or not. So, a secondary character whose main feature is that she is commonly associated with a gorilla is fighting a girl working for the biggest corporation in the empire whose signature attack is a robot that shits lasers. Sounds like some sort of a filler, you'd say? Well, actually, this is a raid into a child experiment department of this facility where they keep a very important kid that is literally a neurotic nuclear bomb in a relationship with an older guy that I'm more than sure inspired at least one fanfiction about it. See what I mean about it being tonally confused? Hatsushi Okubo in general could never write serious political stuff well, mostly because it either bugs down in tedious minutia or serves as a thinly veiled excuse for fight scenes, neither of which really give you a good feel for the characters that make them look shallow and forgettable. He did this in Soul Eater with his arachnophobia arc, and here it's pretty much the same shit, only now with an even bigger body count and introduction of characters that literally died the second they're introduced. And come to think of it, this is probably the reason not many people remember Soul Eater somewhere after episode 28. Where he excels at are the fight scenes that are still grandiose and fun to watch, even if the fire abilities are basically magic at this point. Everything I disliked about the first season is still in force, outside of people we already know about, the main villains are introduced and are wasted an episode in. Shoko Sakabe, you know, the brother of our main hero, was absent throughout the whole thing, yet outside of Karon and Ogun I didn't remember anyone, mostly because everyone else was either useless or died, and all of them could be explained in about two to four words. The graphics are still quite nice to look at, which is especially good for the fight scenes, the music isn't that memorable, but it is thematic and it doesn't ruin the the flow of the show too much. The plot so far isn't that impressive, which is a shame because I actually like the Ace Brigade as characters. They're spunky and positive spirited with this lovable air of having no idea what the fuck they're doing. It is a shame that everything around them is either overly serious or stupid. Kinda like more Germany if you think about it. Fan bases, especially after the invention of the internet, are a very fascinating subject to study because they can range from just a group of like-minded individuals to what will eventually become its own ethnicity given the chance. And like in many historical cases, these fan bases also tend to have their rebellious faces, depressed faces, and faces of idolatry. For the anime community, the old anime titles are usually the most obvious golden cow, with some studios occasionally trying to bring in either their own spin or even their own replacements. The only exceptions I can remember to this are Legends of Galactic Heroes and the Evangelion, the former because no one cares about epic space sagas in this day and age, the latter because the studio continues tweaking the damn thing to this very day. But yes, the great pretenders, the anime I've made a joke ramble about and now I have to actually watch it because otherwise people will call me out for being a two-faced twat. Great Pretenders is an original comedy crime drama made by studio Wit and Hiro Kaburagi, a man responsible for 91 days, which was also a crime drama only less comedic. The story is about Makoto Edamura, a Japanese con man with a very sad past that gets him brawled into schemes of a veteran con man and a gentleman playboy Laurent theory that forces him to travel all over the world and get repeatedly scammed by him. The anime is divided into four cases, each in a different part of the world and delves into the backstory of one of the main characters, but the point in all of them is the same. The team targets some rich corrupt bastard and sooner or later they get a lot of money and live happily ever after. I don't think I should really say this because for creatures like me the inspiration behind the great pretenders is pretty obvious, but if you weren't, say, born yet when Lupin the Third's popularity was at its peak, yes, this is pretty much the director's go at trying to make a story about a troop of rogues doing rogue things. But even with all that, I always try to go into anime I watch with an open mind. I said try, not always successfully, I admit, and having a bit of a soft spot for crime dramas, I found myself trying my hardest to like Great Pretenders. The graphics is gorgeous with these beautiful still shots and contrasting colors, each of them is basically created specifically for people to screenshot them and use as wallpaper, the animation is fluid and reminiscent of the way old animes were animated, which allows the show to keep things realistic while also doing exaggerated movements when needed. The music at first glance isn't that memorable, but then you actually listen to the soundtrack and realize that this is actually a pretty good mood setter and the plot design is made with extreme care to make sure the audience is captivated to the end of the case. I guess I wanted this last ramble of the year to end on a triumphant hurrah to the anime industry in general, because without the shit happening both around me and all over the world, I wanted something nice to watch in a vain attempt to prolong the time before my next suicide attempt. But 
But as I was watching it, the part of my brain that takes almost sexual pleasure in ruining others' enjoyment turned on me, saying, Auntie, we both know that you've sent animes to gallows for less plot problems than this. <sighs> Motherfucker. Remember that part I've said about the plot design being made with extreme care? As you remember, the whole show was structured in blocks of episodes called cases, each following a specific location and a specific backstory. In other words, you can say that the anime structure is four OVAs in a serialized format, and obviously the strongest one is the first one that is supposed to hook the viewer into watching it. Fair enough. The problem with the anime plot-wise is that if you binge-watch it, you quickly start seeing that the director is using the same tricks in each and every case, with Edamura being somehow coerced into a con by Laurent, that Edamura is getting something wrong each time, and that it all ends in something grandiose, or at the very least tries to be. Wikipedia tells me that the last case, that is, the last nine episodes, were aired on Netflix with about a month gap or so after the last case, and I have a suspicion that this was very deliberate, as without a month gap for people to forget about it, I have a strong suspicion that the audience would feel themselves cheated. At least I was. Here I was, watching this anime, soldiering through the repeated story beats, re-watching it with a caretaker to take screenshots and make notes about the story and the characters, only to be met with basically a repeat of every single beat I've seen before, from killing his friends to Edamurai again being coerced into something bad, and by episode 12, when the levels of Keikaku got too melodramatic for my taste, I've decided that this shit is simply not worth my time, because I already know the ending. Here's my predictions, and also probably spoilers. Those two girls are alive, They'll swindle money out of both the Chinese and Japanese mafia, probably trap them somewhere as revenge for that black girl the Chinese killed, but the black girl is actually alive and well, and the next target, given that these things tend to escalate in scope, will be the president of some first world country. Might take it'll be Italy, Spain or USA. Maybe Brazil if they're politically conscious, which I doubt. There, write down in the comments if I'm correct or not, because I'm certainly not planning to watch it anymore. What a nice way to end the year. I want a milkshake.